Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Hey everyone. Hi Jeannie, I see you waving there. Good to see you. Jeannie Grassi. Hi Jeannie. <laughs> yeah, good to see everyone today. Thanks for joining. Let's make sure we get <clears throat> folks in. Because I'll let you in a, a minute late anyway. So we'll we'll definitely launch launch into things today. Um so I'll give a quick introduction. We'll get started chatting with Dale. We don't have any super clear agenda today. So if anybody's got, you know, some some interesting questions or topics to throw out there, uh, we will dive right in. So feel free to put those in the chat or, um, you know, if if it makes sense, you can unmute yourself and we can speak up when the time comes. So, but, but beyond that, I'll just say to anybody watching on Facebook and YouTube, reminder, this is Piano tech radio hour which is brought to you by piano tech missions master classes an online edu educational resource that brings you cutting edge instruction from piano industry ma masters from the comfort of your home and uh yeah we we had a convention back uh, in early 2021 we had one back in december this is really cool kind of the first online conventions going on and ever in the industry. Those are really fun. We're going to be planning one coming up. Thanks for everyone that gave some feedback on how you'd like to set it up. We were asking, would you like it three days in a row or maybe one day each week for three weeks or maybe one day each month for three months? It looks like we're leaning towards one day each week for three weeks, which which is nice because we that's kind of one of the advantages of being online here. You know, you don't have to show up in a place so I think we might do a Thursday of one week, a Friday of the next week, and a Saturday of the next week to accommodate everyone kind of jumping in and making time for work and things like that. Um, that's what it's looking at right now, no guarantees. And that'll probably be somewhere into August, September when we put that on. So excited about getting that next convention together for folks. So without further ado, I will say hello to our guest for today. Really good guy and, uh, you know, I would say a mascot of, of various cool things in the piano industry. Um, his name's Del Fandrick. He's worked in piano design. Um, he's been a consultant for uh, various manufacturers throughout the world. And what I love about Dell is he's kind of, he's one of those people that, um, try, I'm just trying to spotlight him so we can see him for everyone. Um, he's one of those folks that is really great, I think, with sort of first principles thinking, you know, kind of like, okay, so that's how it's done, right? But why? And if I were to do it, you know, from scratch, and I think that's why he's really, really great with design, how, how would I given the result that I want, how would I change the process or what kind of process would I build based on, you know, first principles of how I'd like things to be. So he's come up with really interesting ideas, like how to, um, you know, renew, we call it what resurrecting <laughs> a soundboard. We, we, he helped us with a master class on that using an epoxy, um, maybe kind of a counterintuitive thing. He's discovered a lot of cool stuff. So um, I guess I'll just launch in by saying, welcome, Dale, and uh, what you've been up to, man, since we, <laughs> since we last connected. You survived. You survived the pandemic, and we're really glad uh, we're all still here. What's been li life been like for you? Um, surviving. <laughs> I think the pandemic has affected us pretty much like it has everyone else. <laughs> uh we were being particularly cautious because with my my lungs being like they are, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that if I got it, I was going to, at, at the very least, end up in the hospital and I probably wouldn't have come out. So we isolated ourselves probably earlier than others 
and kept isolated more so than others. So uh, that part of it has been difficult to to get through. But uh, other than that, um, you know, life goes on. We're uh, we're both busy. Barb's doing a lot of editing. Um, I'm doing less piano work than I had done, although I am slowly working on the uh, book that I hope to put out uh, soon about uh, soundboard repair, what we did the awesome. class on. Very cool. Yeah. And is it, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, is it there some other text that you were working on? I don't, I don't want you to have to say about it, but I feel like you're working on another interesting book. Maybe you won't get there. <laughs> Do you want to mention it or is this not a topic to, to share? I'm not sure which other one. Don't you have like a, a kind of a set of texts on piano design in general? I have a lot of um, different single articles that I've written over time. Okay. That several people have suggested that I put into book form. Um, I have not done that as yet. Uh, and I don't know if I will or not. I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting challenge. Um, yeah, it, it's possible. Let's just say it's no it's, pressure. It's possible. No pressure. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, having talked to Mario E. Greg about his whole process of putting together, you know, his book, I know it's a, it's a complicated and grilling process to put together anything. So yeah, no pressure on that. Uh, but, um, I have so people are already private messaging me, messaging me some interesting questions. I've got a handful already, so let's jump in and see. First of all, the publicly posted question is Ken Cop. He said, uh, "Can Dell talk about hybrid scales? Got anything interesting to say about that?" Well, this is a relatively recent uh, additional tool to our our set of of tools that we can um, we can use to to help. Uh, first of all, its, it's most immediate application is in helping uh, some of the really horrendous short piano scales that are out there. Uh, basically, it started out, uh, at least for me, it started out with. Uh, uh, Palello's wire, it's called low tensile strength wire that, uh, he's developed. It's, I think he's having it made in Germany, but he sources it out of, uh, his facility in France. Um, much is said about the, the tensile strength properties of the wire, but for me, that is not the, that's not what, that's not what we really hear. The wire, if you hold it in your hand and compare it to what we think of as traditional uh, piano wire, uh, the low tensile strength wires are much more flexible. Um, and the scaling uh, numbers are essentially the same in that uh, you know, a number, a number uh, 17 wire traditional uh, traditional wire and a low tensile wire of the same length and same diameter are going to have essentially the same tension. But uh, the, the breaking strength is considerably different. The breaking strength of the low tensile strength wire is, is much lower. It'll, it'll break more easily. Where this wire seems to be the most effective, that's not an issue because it's really more effective in, in, for example, the low tenor sections of, of a piano. Um, I've used it in, in some very, very short scales, uh, you know, five foot, five foot two, uh, four foot 10 uh, scaling. There are some that are particularly notoriously badly designed scales like the, the little short Yamahas of a couple of decades back. Um, pianos that, that we used to uh, simply swap out the lowest, I don't recall now, four or five or six notes 
in the low tenor with bichords and you convert them over. Um, there's some some success can be had by just substituting the low tensile strength wires with uh, or the the standard wire with low tensile strength wire. And the tone is not the same as it would be if it were a reasonably designed scale, but it is a lot less bad. Uh, I've set some of these up as direct comparisons on my uh, on my string testing machine, and you can definitely hear the difference between the two types of wire. So there, there is something definitely happening there. Uh, a number of, of very good rebuilders are now incorporating these this automatically in pianos. Another application for it is in as core wire for particularly for monochords on short pianos where flexibility is a real problem. Um, it can make, again, it can make the low bass, uh, the monochord section of, of a short piano sound a lot less bad than it, than it otherwise would have. So yeah, I think it's something that, that if you're restringing pianos, um, it's definitely worthwhile. Uh, there, are, he has, he has several different types. And Plolo has a fairly good uh, website set up. In, in fact, you don't really need to, to know uh, much about scaling at all. Uh, you can use his, what, what it's called, I think, a typogram to feed in the, uh, the lengths of the wires that you're working with, the speaking length of the wire that you're working with, and the diameter of the wire. And he will, his typogram will tell you what, uh, what type of wire should be used type zero type one type two etc so yeah i i i would not restring a short piano or even a mid-sized piano for that matter uh without without using some uh low tensile strength wire now so everything that everything that i've done recently has been hybrid I was curious, like a follow up on that, just just the types of strings and the legs and, and, and how this all plays out. We had David Clavins of Clavins Piano give a lecture at the last online convention we did this year. Uh, have you explored what he's doing at all? You wear much of Clavins? A little bit. I haven't seen any of his pianos personally, but yeah, they're very interesting. Um, I, you know, I have to appreciate stretching the envelope and exploring new ideas. Um, whether they seem practical or not is really irrelevant uh, in in that sense. Um, I would love to be able to go over and, and see and hear some of the, some of the uh, instruments he's installed. Uh, I see a question up above about uh, publishing and editing the book Piano Tone Building. Mm -hmm. That book has been out for some time, and it's available through PDG or it's available directly from us. Uh, just send my wife an email or a text, and and uh, we can get it out to you. Yeah, we can put her email in the chat. Maybe w what is it? B J Fandrick. B J Fandrick at uh, hotmail dot com. <clears throat> put it in there right now. Oh, make yeah, sure that's... I send that to everyone. Explain the book a little bit. That would be good. Well, like, tell people why you put it together and kind of what <laughs> was the purpose. The reason I put it together is there's a lot of very interesting information. I, I first read the book when I was just beginning uh, to learn about pianos. And it taught me a great deal of misinformation uh, about, uh, about piano design. Um, but it was state of the art in 1916, 1917, 18, 1919. The book is a, is a stenographic record of the uh, series of meetings that were held with what they called piano technicians, which these people were really, uh, uh, 
industry people. They were they were manufacturers. They were uh, they were piano builders. Uh, so yes, they were called piano technicians, but they were really industry people, and they discussed a rather wide range of topics. Uh, unfortunately, not not all of the stenographic record was kept. Uh, they took out a lot of the parts that they thought might be misleading or might be uh, too personal, or uh, you know that would be insulting or and some of the real juicy stuff, which I'd love to uh, known what they were saying. But anyway, did Barb just give you a copy? I've got my copy here. The original. Oh, this one's the artwork's better on the front. This is, (laughs) I'll I'll show you why I was interested in doing this project. So, if you, if you can kind of see this, this is one page of what we had to start with. And if you notice, there's no margins. Uh, the It's right out to the edges. And uh, down here at the bottom, I don't know if you can tell, uh, very on, on, on many pages, there would be a line missing at the bottom, or you'd see half of a line that you could just <laughs> barely discern, you could barely make out. So this is a copy of a copy of a copy. This is, as far as I can tell the history of this, it's a third generation uh, reproduction. And it would have been photographed, it would have been, uh, re- it, it, the original book as again, I have not seen an original book, but I was told that the original was actually uh, eight and a half by 11. And this is now, this is six by 10, or no, six by nine. So it's, it's been, it kept getting reduced and reduced and reduced until it was barely readable. So what we did was to scan it, we came up with this. And here's the, here's, the way this one looks inside, if you can see that. Yeah. So, so in, in the other version, you didn't have it like as well organized as to who was speaking and things like that. Yeah, it's completely reset. Uh, I we scanned it, uh, edited it uh, several times. I edited it. Barb edited it, and then I compl- I learned enough about page design. And we bought uh, we bought a package uh, from Adobe called InDesign, and learned how to use that uh, well enough, at least, to put this book together. So the type style is large enough so that my somewhat less than youthful eyes can read it. And I've added, oh gosh, I don't remember now, several hundred footnotes at the bottom of the pages correcting some of what I believe to be the the, uh, the worst errors. Uh, we didn't change the original text at all. The original text is as it appears in the original book. Uh, I didn't feel that it was appropriate to, to make any corrections other than spelling corrections um, and filling in words that were, were, were missing. At the bottom of the page, you You'd have sometimes a you know, like a half of a sentence and just wasn't there, so I had to kind of guess, give it my best shot uh, as to what might might have been there. And then I did a new chapter on soundboard function because there's a lot of misinformation there about how soundboards work. Uh, the authors go into a great a great deal of detail about um, this vibrating disc that's found in the cell of the wood, uh, the, the wall of the wood cell in the tree and how that, uh, that amplifies the sound. And it's just a lot of stuff that, that we know better now. We, we don't believe that stuff anymore. Yeah, um, there is something. And I think that's interesting for you to call out too, because it's, it's sort of like a, it's like a reference point of a piece in history of the piano industry. 
it's definitely a piece of history and and I appreciate it as much as a piece of history. Uh, it talks about uh, certain woods that are not going to be available because they come from the warring countries. Oh, what warring countries? Well, what was going on in 1916? Um, they were looking forward to the time when the war was over because all of these other countries, their manufacturing facilities were being destroyed and America was going to be the only industrial nation on earth that was going to be able to supply the world's needs of, uh, for pianos. Uh, they were looking forward to the day at, at, at the time in some of these, uh, some of these cities where piano factories are located, water was uh, somewhat dangerous to drink. So workers would be drinking beer on the job. Well, I was okay in the morning, but by afternoon, uh, some of the work got a little strange and several of the management people who talked were looking forward to the ultimate solution that was going to solve that. Um, that was prohibition and that was going to solve all of their problems. And so, you know, <laughs> it's interesting to me to get that historical uh, perspective of what was going on in these factories at the time. Um, yeah, for sure. So that's uh, a couple of the building. Yeah, definitely interesting. And it's interesting just to have a more detailed commentary on, you know, how it came to be and what you find the purpose and use, utility of it. Because it it is, I remember picking it up and I wasn't sure exactly the book I was getting. And, and like you said, you're reading some things and you're like, well, these people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> right. So what is this a but useful for a reason? long time, we, we weren't aware of that. For a long time, we thought this was, this was the gospel truth. This was how pianos work. Uh, you know, it talks about sound traveling uh, in different ways that we look at it now. No, no, not really. Uh, so. Anyway, yeah. but I, I found it to be a both a fascinating project and I hope a worthwhile one because it, it put the book into readable form again. Totally. And it reminds me just in, in interacting with various you know piano techs who have been steeped in parts of the piano building process for a while uh, the these instruments my understanding is we, we kind of imagine that you know somebody sat down and they drew this perfect plan of exactly what it's going to be and that that plan was kind of passed down from generation to generation everything had a reason that was very solid and i think yeah. the more that you explore the history of piano building and the design and construction, there are a lot of things are just there because they were there the last time. And, you know, maybe it's kind of like that old story of the ham, you know, we, why do we cut the ends off of the ham? You know, grandma, that's right, well, tradition, you know, that well, was, it, it fit in the pan. How long the pan was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that is a good point because they, uh, a lot of what you read there, um, You'll, you'll find there are some people who are really struggling to, to bring the piano industry out of this strictly empirical trial and error uh, approach to building. We look at these pianos down. I read this constantly about somebody will say something like, well, that piano was designed to, to have this particular uh, scaling that to be tuned at four, four. No. <laughs> They really weren't. Um, the design was basically empirical. Uh, it talks about one bass string winder uh, where I think I think it's uh, Morton who's one of the he's the moderator through a lot of this. <clears throat> he goes in to uh, visit the string winder, and there's all these broken strings sitting around. And well, what are you doing? And, well, I'm trying to get a set of bass strings that will work with what this manufacturer has sent to me. Well, why don't you just tell the manufacturer to, you know, make a, a usable scale? Oh, I can't do that. He says, yeah, yeah. if I do that, the, they'll just go someplace else and, and get strings. So he, what he's doing is he's, he's not designing strings for tone. He's designing strings that, that will fit a very badly designed base section and not break. 
the, this is not exactly the what, what what we think of when we think of early piano builders doing this wonderfully subtle, gorgeous design work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating the whole process, and and also just things that I've heard about, you know piano design details numbers measurements things being written on the walls of factories and yeah somebody coming in to 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 repaint and people going, no, 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 don't paint that wall because that's where that's the place where we're storing the information that we need you know to build these pianos um and it just makes you think of a little bit more delicate and a little, little bit less intentional uh, around some of these aspects Let's, it's very empirical not yeah, I, I, I say these things, but bearing in mind, the, these were some very, very smart people mm -hmm. doing this. And they would, they would listen carefully and they would think and they would evaluate. So, yes, it was empirical, but um, the better of them, they, they developed, they, they, they came closer to reality than, than, than others did. And you can you can often you can tell when you service these pianos, uh, God, this thing was just thrown together, or or this one really had some some thought put into it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's it's a it's a it's a grab bag. Cool. Well, I'll I'll go back to some of these other questions. They they came to me privately, so we haven't seen them in the in the chat. You haven't seen them yet. Um, Jim Kelly asked, "Can Dell talk about the alternate sized keyboards? Uh, he thinks you were involved in some of the research around them. High Loon offers them, but wondering mm -hmm. if Yamaha and others Yamaha and others may. Any awareness around that? Well, uh, my research to the extent of I've drawn some head scales." that uh, there, the, uh, there is a group, um, pianists, something for alternate size uh, keyboards, P-A-S-K, I think it is. Uh, and they have a presence on, uh, on Facebook. I, I would guess if you just uh, go on there and type in P-A-S-K, you'll, you'll find a lot of information about that. Um, yeah, it, it turns out that the, the, there, there really is no international standard for the width of the keyboard. <clears throat> I had done some studies back at, at Baldwin. I looked through a lot of their archival, um, information and I found reference to a, uh, a so-called international standard that, that was established in the late 40s, I think it was, it was supposed to be 1,220 millimeters, which is uh, just a little bit more than 48 inches. Uh, so when I was designing uh, the small uh, the small Baldwin Grand, uh, I very carefully laid out the the head scale to this so-called international design, and when I turned the the design in. Uh, they sent it to the key makers down in Juarez, and Juarez sent it back. Says we can't do this. Uh, well, what do you mean? Well, that's not what we build. Oh, you know, it was dumb on my part because I didn't check to see what they were building. I just went by what was supposed to be the international standard. Uh, and it turns out that that uh, just about every company that makes keys makes them a little bit differently. There. They're not all the same width. Uh, ironically, at the time, and this was in, in the later 80s, uh, I found that Yamaha was probably the widest uh, head scale available, which I thought was somewhat ironic since Asian people generally have smaller hands. Uh, I wanted to do a smaller key bed uh, head scale on, on that particular piano because uh, my idea was that, well, it was going to be purchased by a lot of students, young students or parents of young students, uh, they're going to have smaller hands. So let's make the piano a little easier for them to play. Um, you thought I had, I had uh, suggested eliminating apple pie. Uh, it was just, everybody was horrified because you, you oh, you couldn't do that. You, you grow up pl playing on uh, a 
the small one you, you, you that would hinder you later when you had to to transition to a, a standard size keyboard, uh, which I don't think I don't think that has gotten through the violin makers yet because they persist in making uh, smaller violins for smaller children. And I, amazingly, they, these children somehow manage to adapt as they grow up and get bigger and go to bigger instruments. Um, anyway, yeah, there is. Uh, they're, 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 they have come up with three sizes, which if memory serves, uh, the smallest one is 5.5 inches per for one octave, and that's center to center from, for, for example, C to C. Uh, five and a half inches, six inches, and six and a half inches. Uh, and there, there's a, a, a company in Philadelphia, I think it is, that has actually made a number of these uh, this, these head scale or these key sets for different pianos. Very, very expensive. And the smaller ones especially are very problematic in fitting to existing pianos. So I looked into it and I wrote some stuff about this. And in fact, I wrote something about it in the journal a couple of years ago. Uh, that if if we really want to do this, uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to redesign our piano somewhat uh, because you have to get the what what's called the uh, uh, the strike line, which is the distance from the center the center point of A1 to the center point of, of C88, you have to get that reduced. It, it, it varies in, in different pianos, depending on all kinds of complicated uh, interact, interactive components like the string angles, and uh, center to center spacing of, of the uh, uh, action components along the key rail. Um, but the wider that's, uh, the wider that uh, strike line is, the more difficult it becomes to get down to some of these smaller, uh, smaller uh, key head scales. And uh, ironically, uh, what I what I introduced uh, the ideas I introduced in the articles I was writing was uh, if if we want this, uh, what we're going to need to do is go back to to flat strung grants. Because you can design a flat strung piano with a strike line that is or strike a uh, scale stick that is perfect. I mean, it's very easy to do. Um, and that, of course, brings up a whole other well, we can't have flat strung pianos because blah, 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 all of the perceived reasons, almost none of which make any real sense. Yeah. That's the type of thinking I was talking about up front. <laughs> and also, I mean, just the example that you gave about violins, right? I mean, I, I think for me, I, that wouldn't have came immediately to mind, but it's so obvious when you say something like that, right? Like that doesn't seem to stop the violin makers from making smaller violins. Um, yeah. So well, the people who actually play on these pianos um, uh, daily, uh, when they do get to a concert hall and they have to play on a perform on a piano with a full size keyboard they say yes it does take a little bit of getting used to again right. but they pretty much have it down in a half an hour so it's not it's not a real big issue and since most people uh perform on one piano over and over in their own homes uh that's really a non issue and it is something i think that piano makers need to address it, it really does uh, you know there's a lot of hand injuries are the result of people playing on on key head scales that, that, that force their their fingers to do things that our fingers aren't designed to do mm -hmm. yeah that makes a lot of sense next question i'll head back to what is this? Jim Kelly said, also any comments about other materials that could be substituted for felt? He thought he had heard about a, something like a rubber that could be substituted for felt. Is, have you heard of this? Yes. Every time I've seen it happen or have you seen it tried, I, I've also seen it fail. Um, 
rubber falls apart. It does all kinds of weird things that you that you don't expect felt to do. I doubt we're going to come up with any practical solution for wool felt anytime soon for the piano. Manufacturers would love to because uh, good wool felt is expensive, but uh, it has properties that so far synthetics have not matched. Uh, I know of several manufacturers who have uh, tried to reduce the cost of hammer felt by uh, by using blends. And it just doesn't work very well. Uh, they, the blends don't have the interlocking capabilities of the wool fibers and they, they break down faster. They, um, they don't the sound. Has like a, the wool has a, spr a springiness to it that is particularly well, it does, and it also, useful, has, right? it also has scales that interlock, and which is what happens during the felting process. Uh, it's it's the the wool fibers are pounded together, and they they twist and they interlock and they grab each other and they hold together, which gives it both body and resilience. And you can carry that to extremes. Uh, I looked at some felt at uh, the Bacon Company that was, you could practically drive nails with it and stuff. It was so hard. I forgot what the application was. It was used for some kind of a, a bearing material in a, in a ship's uh, drive drivetrain, I think. Uh, I, I don't remember for sure. But, uh, yeah, it, I, I don't think we're going to find a viable solution. You know, manufacturers that, uh, keep trying to do this kind of stuff like less expensive pedal systems, trap work systems. Oh, well, let's just put a rubber bushing in there. And then, you know, five years later, the technician is trying to figure out, well, how do I replace that, that plastic part that broke? Uh, and it's not really something I can just replace with leather or felt. So, you know, it, yes, it saves the manufacturer a couple of pennies early on, but um, is it worth it? I don't think so. Same thing with so, leather, except leather, uh, there is a material that's being made called exane <clears throat> that uh, does pretty good in replacing certain leather components. For example, uh, hammer knuckles, back checks. Um, and that material seems to be working pretty well. Interesting. Yeah, I was, I mean, during the conventions that we've had, it's been fascinating to see some of the people that come in and just, there's so much to be said about wool in, in the piano manufacturing process. Um, we had uh, David Stanwood come in and, and talk all, quite a bit about wool. Of course, his wife does felt work as well. So he has a particularly unique perspective on wool and then we had uh alex kirsten from sign graver also just talk about pretty in depth about how they think about wool and and what an important role it plays in the process of creating their instruments i mean that's yeah, for hammers of course there's be, i don't think that's going to be replaced anytime soon right um let's see here what else do we have here in the chat and now it was this sort of somebody said acknowledging maybe it's a, a stupid question i think i know the answer the hybrid scale that's mean means using more than one type of wire sort of like, yeah it's uh in, in palello's case i think he has four uh maybe five he also incidentally uh and this is something to keep in mind if you're servicing a steinway model s which uh has a treble section that's designed to break just about any wire known. Uh, the, the, the speaking length in, in those pianos is simply too high, which means the tension is also too high. And Palello makes one wire which is particularly high tensile, has a particularly high tensile strength, which I am told will stand up in that scale. So, um, it would be certainly worth a try. It's less expensive than than uh, replacing the bridge anyway. Um, but yeah, he has one, a Type M, I think, is uh, modern. 
or fairly normal is pretty much like Roslau or Mainz, IG wire. And then there's a type zero, type one, and a type two, I think are the three. The type two if, is something that, that you're not gonna use much in modern pianos, but it's quite useful in, in early uh, pianofortes. Uh, but we, the type zero and type one are more commonly used. Uh, the type one being the lower of the, of those two. Um, so yeah, and personally, uh, I, I have used them primarily in tenor sections and in the cores of certain bass strings. So I don't keep the smaller wires in stock but I do keep the, the larger ones that you would find uh, typically used in a tenor section of a piano. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we have a question from Jeannie Grassi. She says, can you talk about what sorts of things to listen for when evaluating soundboards? For example, beyond measuring for crown or down burying, what does a good soundboard sound like? Well, it sounds like it makes good music. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that wasn't the answer you were looking for, was it? Well, okay, think about it. What happens What happens when a soundboard quote goes bad? And I I I go into this quite a bit in the uh in the first half of the book that I'm putting together. <clears throat> um why do we measure crown? What are we what are, what what's the point? Uh well, we measure crown because crown has to be there for for the, the piano to sound good. Why? What, what is it about crown in a soundboard that makes that soundboard sound any different than a soundboard over here that doesn't have crown? Well, what it does is uh, it's a way to add stiffness to the soundboard without adding weight mass to the soundboard. So what does that mean? Well, you put the board together and if you if you simply glued the assembly together flat, flat ribs, room temperature, soundboards at room temperature, glue it together, no crown at all. You support it uh, on the parameter, you put a weight in the middle and you measure the deflection. Well, so deflects, pick a number, five millimeters. <clears throat> now you take the same wood panel, you dry it out, and you glue it to flat ribs. Now take it out in the shop and you let that, that soundboard absorb some moisture. It's going to try to expand, but it's glued to the ribs, so it can't really expand too much. What it's going to do is going to force a curve into that that assembly. Now you take it back to your same little fixture, you support it, put the same weight in the middle of it, and you measure the deflection. It's not going to be five millimeters, it might be two or two and a half or three. It'll be less. So what does that tell us? It tells us, and I, I sample this and I, I built up some samples and I I I measure deflection on on one of them when it's oven dry and then I let it take on moisture and, and measure the deflection again. And the, the deflection is significantly different. Um, so what we've done is we've made it stiffer. Now, what does that have to do with music? Well, when the string vibrates, there is, there's energy that is transferred from the vibrating string down through the bridge and into the soundboard assembly. So that that vibrating energy causes a soundboard to physically move. How much does it move? Well, how much does it weigh and how stiff is it? Oh, we're back to stiffness again. So putting crown in a soundboard has nothing to do with changing its mass or its weight, but it has some to do with changing its stiffness. So what happens when you lose stiffness? Well, Energy is going to be transferred from the strings into the soundboard at a different rate. It's going to be transferred faster. 
Well, what part of the soundboards, what part of the, the musical spectrum is going to be transferred? It turns out that uh, in the treble section, uh, it's going to, it's the, the, a, a less stiff soundboard will absorb high frequency energy more quickly in a, in a less stiff soundboard. So over time, as soundboard stiffness decreases, which it always does with a compression crown soundboard, um, due to several factors, would creep, uh, long-term creep. That's uh, when, when, when we're measuring uh, soundboard crown, what you're really measuring is the effect of long, long-term creep or compression set, if you will. So as the wood fibers change physically because of compression set, that means that the internal compression in the panel is decreasing and the, the soundboard is becoming less stiff. So the high frequency energy in the strings is going to be dissipated at a faster rate. What does that mean in terms of tone? It means that in in the upper area, roughly the top third of the piano, which is where it's most noticeable, uh, the sound is going to become somewhat more per, per, excuse me, percussive. Um, and the sustain of the sound will become less. Since most pianos have somewhat problematic designs in the treble section anyway, uh, they're, they're just kind of already hanging on by the skin of their little teeth. Anything that happens up there that's going to cause energy to be drained off more quickly is going to significantly affect how the piano sounds. So the, the sound gets increasingly percussive. It, you have that bright, sharp attack sound and it dies out uh, very quickly. You can make this somewhat less bad by uh, changing characteristics of the hammer, which are almost always heavier than they should be in the, at least in the upper part of the scale. So you can, you can fuss around with it that way. But uh, if the, if the, the, if piano has, has lost crown and I, I really don't like to use the phrasing lost crown because what we're really talking about if it's lost stiffness, then, and, and I say that because I have come across too many pianos that have no crown whatsoever, but function quite nicely uh, as, as musical soundboards. So it's not just a matter of, of um, not just a matter of crown, it's, it's a combination of factors. But that, that will be the acoustical uh, the acoustical warning sign that the soundboard is, is going, going south, is going bad. Uh, and historically there has been almost nothing that can be done. Once it's gone, it's gone. You send the piano someplace and have the soundboard replaced. Uh, the, the, the process, and we talked about this in an earlier session, uh, of, of treating it with, with epoxy uh, in certain ways will help considerably. Not by re restoring crown, it does not do that, but it does restore stiffness. Yeah, and it, it works surprisingly well. And uh, quite a few people have <clears throat> said they tried it and, and really appreciated the technique. Uh, let's see here. Let's try to fit in a question or two more and then we'll, we'll sign out. We got about uh, seven minutes left in the hour. Bruce Gibson had a question that you may or may not have an answer to. He works on a lot of upright pianos from the early 1900s with loose center pins. Very few customers in the area want to pay for complete repinning. Do you know, <laughs> that's not surprising. <laughs> do you know of a liquid solution that would tighten center pin bushings? I do not. If you want them super tight, you could try super glue, but uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, I presumably there are some uh, 
aren't aren't some of the supply companies selling something like uh, Profelt or you know, I have no idea if those work or not. I've not tried them. I'm I'm particularly leery of chemicals in um, piano actions. Um, one of my early experiences with that was a there was a new lubricant put on the market. Uh, it's called L. I think it was LPS three or something like that. And it was uh, promoted at one of our uh, by somebody one of our conventions. Uh, this was just the greatest thing ever, and he demonstrated it. And, and wow, bunch of tight flanges loosened them. That was great. So um, we tried that you know, on a on a piano, and it, and it was it was wonderful. And about nine months or a year later, the the client called back and said. Oh, you know, the pianos are getting really hard to play and some of the notes don't repeat themselves. I went out there and looked at it and that, at, that action had locked up tight. Uh, so, um, I ended up buying a new set of, uh, hammer shanks for that piano and I have never forgotten that, uh, little experience. Uh, that was at my expense, not theirs because it was my fault. I put, I put the stuff on there. Um, so I'm yeah. I'm very cautious when it comes to putting chemicals on actions. Uh, I'll let other people do the experimenting. But no, the short answer is I really don't. Uh, so there's a question in here, which I know we're not going to have enough time to cover the details. And I had something I wanted to uh, to, to quickly uh, bring in for the last minute or two. But I'll, I'll state the question and maybe we, we leave it for the next time. It's a, it's a appropriate question for you from Sky Meadows. Um, are there other materials be, being considered for soundboards and cases? Um, she knows some wood parts are being replaced with carbon fiber. Uh, maybe just in, you know, <laughs> this is kind of a silly request. This is in a minute or two, maybe an overview of things that you've seen on that. I don't answer anything in a minute or two. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, there are. Uh, it's, it's also something I've done some experimenting on, and I didn't I do a class on that? Uh, we talked about alternate soundboard materials. Yes, definitely. We have a we have a master class on that as well. Yeah. If if anybody's interested, so we've mentioned a couple master classes today. I don't know if I'll have time to dig up the links for them, but if you're interested in master class on re resurrecting the piano soundboard with epoxy, we have that with. Yeah. Uh, we also have um, one where he talks about um, updating materials for soundboard, kind of the latest research that he's doing and things that he's seeing. And he talks well, about, about that. Richard Dane in England has done a fair amount of research with uh, carbon fiber. Uh, and some of, some of that has appeared in Steingraber pianos. Personally, I'm skeptical of carbon fiber. It's a great material for a lot of things. But I'll tell you, that stuff rings like a bell. Uh, it has no internal damping or very, very low internal damping qualities. Whereas wood is much higher. It dampens out uh, fairly effectively. It, what we're trying to do is dampen out a lot of the very ugly high partial stuff that otherwise we just really don't like to hear. Uh, but there are other materials and there's other ways to treat it. You can, you can face uh, carbon fiber with uh, wood veneers, for example, uh, which to help help uh, dampen it out. But there are also other fibers that can be used. Um, I've experimented with flax fiber, for example. Uh, I think that some probably hemp fibers might uh, might be usable at some point if we can never get over our reluctance to grow the stuff. Um, you say, uh, yes, I think that the advantages of, uh, of other fibers being used other than, than wood fibers, um, I think that ultimately we're going to have to if we're going to continue building good pianos. And I say that because we are rapidly running out of anything uh, resembling good musical grade spruce. Uh, some of the spruce I've seen in, in pianos uh, over the past few years is not as good as the shipping uh, cartons that we used to get from Posey 
back when I started uh, putting soundboards in in the 70s. So, you know, when I was back in those days, vertical grain was considered anything about 20 to 30 degrees off of off of 90 off of vertical. Uh, gosh, I'm seeing stuff now that's more than 45 degrees off. Well, that's not really vertical grain anymore. Now we're getting the flat saw and lumber. Uh, where does this end? Um, I think an interim step is, is a good grade uh, laminated board. But even that is a, that that's that's an intermediate step. So yeah, uh, I think it's something that first of all we have to get over our prejudices against it. Uh, but, but then we have to start doing some serious work on on actually getting in there and trying it. And the reason I'm not doing that is because it's not inexpensive. Right. And I haven't found a, a, a wealthy sponsor. All right. Well, any of us wealthy sponsors out here, contact <laughs> Dell if you want to be his patron. <laughs> the muse of Dell Fandrick. <laughs> You've got a little competition, Barbara, but she's probably she's probably already contributed all the money that she can to his, <laughs> his cookie projects. <laughs> hey, uh, nothing I have done. <laughs> would have been possible without that woman. So uh, she's a keeper. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, Barbara's on the call today. Hello, Barbara. Good to have you here. Um, yeah, so we're, you know, of course, as always, you've got a lot of great stuff to share, and we appreciate all that. We're, we're going to have to sign off here in a minute. Um, so I'll wrap things up. Uh, but if anybody has questions or wants to follow up, you can email us and you know, we can get conversations started about various things. I tried to put, um, I tried to put some links in the chat. Actually, we did find some links to some of the classes that uh, we mentioned here that Dell has taught for piano technicians master classes. If you want to copy the chat, um, I'll explain it really quickly. In the lower left, right hand corner of the chat, there's a three dots in a little square. If you click on that and hit save chat, it will save the chat to your computer. And then after it says it's saving it, there's actually a link that appears for maybe five seconds. It tells you how to get to the folder where it saved it. Um, but generally, it's your documents folder. In, in I think it's in documents folder in a Zoom. How, that having been said, I'll try to have um, our follow-up email that comes after the session include some of that information. And um, I'll keep everybody on for just one more minute um, because wanted to share a few things and again we'll share this in an email but you know i think some of you probably have noticed or all of you probably noticed that david anderson has not been with us for the past few weeks um for those that didn't explicitly understand he was battling cancer for you know several months of the past year he actually was in remission for that uh, but recently he he's having some issues medical issues that they're not quite yeah. sure um what, what's going on, uh, some issues with his brain. And so they're trying to figure out what's going on. So he's kind of just been really taking it easy um, for the time being. But uh, I wanted to include some information. You know, we have permission to share this. I put uh, his wife's contact information in the chat if anybody wants to reach out. Um, her name's Tanya Regeer, um, Tanya at TanyaRegeer.com. Her phone, she said to, it's okay to share her phone number. I put that in the chat. Um, and then there's a link in the chat where it's a it's a website where they were sharing information um, during his battle with cancer. So they've just left that up to share if anybody wants updates with how he's doing um, at the moment. So uh, we'll we'll put that information in the email. But I just wanted to you know just take a moment to say you know of course we all miss David Anderson. I haven't gone into a lot of detail about what, what he's been up to. Just want to keep people informed and, uh, and go ahead. If, if you're inclined, you know, take a minute to, to find a way to know, to, to let them know that you're thinking about him. So, uh, so he can, uh, get through the next phase of things. They're, they're hoping to figure out what's going on and, uh, and tackle it in the next few weeks. All right. So thank you all so much for joining. And again, thank you, Dell. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.